So Lord, bless this day and bless us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I'm sure most here are very familiar with the work of German Air Arthur Rank. So I shan't say much about that, but just to remind you that our strapline is helping rural churches and communities to flourish. And that's not a bad aspiration uh, in my judgment. And it goes to the heart of what we're about today. Uh, to acknowledge, despite our various discouragements, that the gospel is alive and well across our rural churches and communities uh, and that it's a privilege to be involved in making it that bit more effective with God's grace. And that's why we're here today. Um, again, as many of you are familiar, Germinate Leadership, this will be the third of these uh, annual lectures uh, and the third group of Germinate uh, participants uh, graduated. The whole program started with a, uh, a pilot uh, group up in Yorkshire, um, which uh, appeared to work reasonably well. And as a consequence, was eventually rolled out uh, with the good offices of the Arthur Rank Centre. Um, and as I say, we're now at our third lecture and little graduation ceremony. So it's a real privilege to be here and to welcome you. And uh, it's now my very special pleasure to welcome Anne. Um, having uh, come as a missionary down to these pagan parts <laughs> from uh, the wonderful country north of the border. And it's really good to see you and to welcome you, Anne. I note that your first degree was in prehistoric archaeology. Um, and uh, I was reflecting on the link uh, between that and uh, your current work and activity. Um, you uh, eventually, I think, studied at St. John's uh, Nottingham. Uh, and that was in the topic of practical theology. And that's the sort of theology that rings true with me, and I would like to think what we're about today and indeed on this program. I think it's two and a half years since you were appointed as the first principal of the Scottish Episcopal Institute, and we congratulate you on that, and I know that you're really encouraged and enjoying that role. And I looked up what the aspiration of that institute would be, and I quote, it will shape the character and quality of our ministry in the next generation. What a wonderful aspiration and quite a challenging role. It will shape the character and quality of our ministry in the next generation. Um, and I know your career, uh, 27 years I think since your ordination, uh, has been heavily involved in shaping ministry uh, and clergy and laity in uh, very many parts of, of, of Scotland. So I, I would suggest that there are a few, if any, who <coughs> qualify to come and speak to us this morning. I'm fascinated, and I know others are, uh, by the title of you t your talk. Where you stand is how you lead. Ladies and gentlemen, would you welcome Canon Dr. Anne Donnelly. Thank you for that very generous welcome, and it's really good to be here. Um, have I got this a bit too close to me? I'll, uh, I'll adjust the volume. Thank you. Sorry, Anne, to interject. I should have said that Louise will just explain why the cameras are here, so I don't want you all to feel very self-conscious. Um, but we are filming. I wish we were. <laughs> um, so essentially we've got the cameras here today for three purposes. One is to create some general promotional images and footage for us to use here. Um, the second is so that we can 
put the whole of Anne's uh, lecture onto the internet, on our website and on a couple of other places. So those who can't be here today get the whole benefit of what Anne has to say to us. And the third reason is that over the next uh, couple of months we're going to produce a promotional video for Germinate Leadership. Uh, and one of the things that will help us with that is if you would all make yourselves available during the course of lunchtime in particular to Barry, um, who has lots of really lovely, thought-provoking, insightful questions to ask you <laughs> about your connections with Germinate Leadership. So hopefully that explains the cameras. Um, please be kind of proactive and smiley and engaging <laughs> <laughs> um, because that will help us to, uh, to promote Germinate Leadership and I hope that you would agree with us that that is a worthy thing to be aiming to do. Theologies of liberation have reminded us that all knowledge is contextual. Where you stand affects what you see. So I preface this lecture with locating myself for you, first geographically. I live and work in the Anglican province of the Scottish Episcopal Church. That's seven dioceses covering the whole of Scotland, including its many uh, island archipelagos. So on the northwest there you've got the Diocese of Argyll and the Isles. You need a boat if you're going to be the bishop there. And also uh, you've got Murray, Ross and Keith Ness at the top. And then on the east you've got a diocese that's called Aberdeen and Orkney. And the Shetland people get very upset about that because they don't figure in the title, but it also includes <coughs> Shetland. <coughs> Much of this landscape is rural, and indeed very remote rural at that, to use the Scottish Government classification. Uh, all that you see in that kind of pale lemon is classified as very remote rural. And as the leaflets that I've distributed and put on your chairs indicate, there are Scottish Episcopal churches across the entire country. We're not, and never have been, the established church, but we have a very good coverage over the whole nation. So, as was said a moment ago, for the past 27 years I've worked in this setting, specifically in the field of theological education. For a while I worked mainly with remote rural charges, equipping congregations to become reflective practitioners and missional agencies in and to their local communities. This was a form of local shared ministry, very much akin to that found in North Michigan and New Zealand. So here is a little congregation on St. Margaret's Arran, another one in St. Kieran's Campbelltown. I've already heard from somebody who's had a holiday there. Uh, so these are small congregations learning to do theological reflection. And in fact, that one with all the coffee cups was uh, the, uh, the sermon slot. So they leave the front of the church, they go and do a kind of contextual Bible study during the sermon slot, and then they go back into their pews. So these are feisty, small, outward looking, um, quite radical congregations. And finally, anybody been to the Isle of Lewis? This is St. Maluag's Europe. There's been a church there since the 13th century. It doesn't have electricity, but as you can see, it's got a fair sized congregation still. So these are some of the little congregations I worked with for about seven years. After that, I went and worked in the Diocese of Glasgow and Galloway. Uh, so our border uh, was uh, akin to that of the Carlisle Diocese. And in fact, I worked a lot with Anu when I was there. It's a very rural diocese, although you might not think so if you think just of Glasgow and the conurbations around Glasgow, but actually large swathes of Glasgow and Galloway are very rural. And again, I was working with congregations, clergy, what we call vestries, PCCs, to encourage, equip and enable outward facing ministries for mission. And then laterally, my focus has contracted to the realm of those who will go on to lead such congregations within our church's training agency. We just have the one <coughs> theological college for the whole province, um, the Scottish Episcopal Institute. That's some of last year's new intake, and I'm very pleased that we're getting so many younger <coughs> students coming in now from all traditions of the church, all training in the one theological institute. So in all three jobs, I've encouraged people to think about the kinds of leadership needed in rural, multi-church contexts, where, as you so well know, one, the old model of one priest, one parish no longer suffices. I've exhorted people to read the kind of literature that the Germinate course recommends, 
indeed a couple of years ago I had the great privilege of mentoring a participant on I think the first course and was thrilled to enlarge my knowledge of the subject by the books and articles that he was given to read and which we discussed together. So thank you Richard for uh, doing this course because I learned through his doing of it. So taking the best of modern leadership thinking into our practice as congregational leaders is vital and I don't want to decry that in any way. But my experience was that it wasn't enough. Early experiments in local shared ministry in Scotland faltered not because people, and that was clergy and laity alike, didn't have the technical expertise. They did. They had it in spades. They could talk about collaborative leadership very fluently, and yet they failed to walk the talk. Culture eats strategy, as Peter Drucker put it, and the old hierarchical leadership culture gobbled attempts to model a new way of being. When push came to shove, and even when there wasn't a crisis, people reverted to type. The former ways prevailed. If collaborative patterns of ministry are to succeed, it's my contention, born of these very hard experiences north of the border, that we must work harder at forming the hearts, the characters of those involved. We must work as hard on that aspect of training as on the technical side of things. And so to my second bit of introductory contextualising, I am a deacon, and I have been for some 27 years. I see things from that viewpoint. My worldview is shaped by that calling. And in this lecture, I want to make the case that where the Anglican deacon stands in the liturgy symbolises three attitudes which form the essential building blocks of all collaborative leadership. If, as the Released for Mission report so beautifully put it, if the church is to develop an enabling and equipping style of leadership that seeks to grow and facilitate the discipleship of lay people, then I maintain that those leaders, lay and ordained, need to take on board three attitudes. Attitudes which are embodied, enacted, in the stance of a deacon in the Eucharist. Now, this isn't a push to get more people to be deacons, though it's certainly fascinating to read the recent correspondence on this topic in the Church Times and elsewhere. And a very good case can be made for a missional church needing deacons. But that's a topic for another lecture. It's not my topic today. And I'm aware also that for many of you in this room, Anglican deacons are not part of your everyday experience. And that goes as much for Anglicans as it does for anybody else. <laughs> So this is not a vocational lecture. Rather, what I'm trying to say is that deep in the heart of my own tradition, there lies an understanding of collaborative leadership. And that understanding is played out, signed, signalled, if you like, before our eyes at every Eucharist at which a deacon is present. And I believe that that understanding has something very precious to offer our formational task for where you stand affects how you lead. Where then do deacons position themselves in the liturgy? Where literally do they stand Sunday by Sunday? At two points early on in the Eucharist, we meet them standing amongst others for the proclaiming of the gospel, often read from the middle of the nave and facing west, and for the leading of the prayers of the people, the intercessions. Deacons are quite literally surrounded by the assembled congregation whom they serve. On both occasions, the assembly indicates its full involvement in and ownership of the action by engaging in dialogue. Variously, the call and response at the outset of the gospel reading, the Lord be with you. And the Lord be with you. Other gospel acclamations at the beginning and end of the reading and the offering of congregational responses in the prayers. Standing amidst others, standing on the same level as them, in an authorised role, and yet at the same time being the servant of all, says something I think very profound about leadership. It signifies that leadership isn't just an individual quality, it's a collective resource. This understanding is in tune with many observations made by modern leadership gurus, not least 
Keith Grint in his book Leadership Limits and Possibilities, which I'm sure many of you have read in the course of your studies. Grint, Professor of Leadership Studies at Lancaster Management School, observes that the key to good leadership is not a list of skills or competencies, or even the amount of personal charisma you possess, but whether you have the capacity to learn from those amongst whom you work. Such learning, he maintains, is inevitably embedded in a relational model of leadership. Dyadic models of exchange between leader and follower are hardly novel, but generally the relationship is construed as focusing upon the change required of the follower. Grint turns that on its head and suggests instead that the onus is just as much upon the leader. He or she needs to learn how to lead just as much as the follower has to learn how to follow. Learning is an iterative process done within a community of practice. <coughs> Leaders, Grint maintains, learn by continually transforming their own practice as they remain open to the needs of the communities to which they belong. They learn by listening to the other, and you can construe whether that has a small or a large O. It's what those of us who are parents do or did. Handed a newborn for the first time, we may hold her very awkwardly, and immediately she lets out a wail, throwing out her arms to let <coughs> us know that she feels insecure. So we adjust our hold, cradling her just that little bit more securely and tenderly, holding her head gently in the palm of our hand, and gradually she settles, the wail dies down, one hopes. Our practice has been improved. We are taught to be parents by listening and responding to our offspring. So it is with leadership in the church. Imposing prefab solutions gets us nowhere. We need to engage in joint learning by a process of dialogue and critique in community. No leader is, or should ever pretend to be, only competent but must work with others to grow in their ability to address the needs of the community amongst whom they work. Leadership is learned step by step in real situations through progressive reflection with others. One of the key skills that we teach our students in their very first year of training for leadership as clergy or leaders is that of theological reflection. But not just theological reflection as an individual capacity, crucial though that is, but reflection in community. We do this in the classroom, but we also lay great emphasis in their first placement experience upon this skill. Great emphasis. Greater indeed than on preaching or learning how to lead worship. The art of learning to engage with the people of God in theological reflection and transformative practice is paramount in our eyes. It must come first. The great Alan Eccleston is renowned for introducing the concept of the parish meeting into the life of the congregations who he served. A once a week gathering of the flock to be the church facing its daily work and ready to find out how that is to be tackled. In her reflections upon this practice, Margaret Selby comments that in this way, he sought to discover ways in which every single member of a congregation might achieve their full potential, their full sense of personal self-worth within the setting of the congregation. And she goes on, to have this as his aim redefined his own understanding of priestly leadership. For him, it made sense only within the body of Christ in a given place, as together they wrestled with the week-by-week -week task of understanding how their life together should impact on the world. That, I think, is relational leadership at its very best, enabling the people of God in a particular place to get to grips through collective reflection with the messy reality of everyday life learning through effort-filled, deliberative processes what Christianity stands for in our lives and for our time. That's a quote many of you will recognize from Catherine Tanner. 
distributing leadership through the whole body of Christ in a place so that everyone grows as responsible disciples and together takes ownership of the missional vocation of the parish, realizing their part in the overall enterprise. Such distributed relational leadership is even more essential in rural congregations, for, as Emil Osmiston pointed out, such churches operate as families, not as organisations. Everything works on the basis of relationship, rather than structure or systems. The character of the leader, the oh-so-very-visible character of the leader, and his or her attitudes are what really count. <coughs> Leadership in rural charges is counter-individualist and therefore requires a very, very particular kind of sustaining spirituality. <coughs> Relational leaders are undefended leaders, operating out of a culture of graced generosity, which believes that in God's economy there is enough to go round. Instead of leading out of emptiness, such leaders know that there is a fullness that meets all needs, extravagantly, overwhelmingly, and with 12 baskets left over. Such a core belief thus impels them to share leadership, not to arrogate it all to themselves. Impels them to find ways to encourage and cultivate the gifts of others, trust others, and take the risk of setting them free to succeed and fail the leadership is not possessive about achievements, it's playful and compassionate and generous with praise. Such leaders engage in what David Brown beautifully calls unrobed friendship. They are vulnerable servants who need the people as much as they need him or her. They co-create relationships, not based on power, but on dialogue, trust, theological reflection and connectivity respecting the particular character of the context and the community in which they are set. They are incomplete, or rather their offering is made complete by the contribution of others. Now, deacons know that in their very bones. So often we're defined by what we are not. Proto-priests, I've been called, or priests monke who cannot and then follows a long list of sacramental activities in which we do not engage. But deacons don't see the world like this. They don't engage in deficit accounting. We are not ministerially greedy. Rather, a diaconal spirituality revels in the fact that the diaconal contribution is only one part of the picture, one jigsaw piece in a much more complex and richer whole. Deacons cannot, in fact, do not fly solo. They encourage the creation of what Joseph Raylin calls leaderful communities. The first diaconal stance then, exposed out there in the midst, reminds the church visibly, viscerally, Sunday by Sunday, that leadership is a collective practice. And that leaders operate first and foremost as part of the context in which they operate. The diaconal call and response and the positioning of the deacon as she leads the gospel or leads the prayers of the people speaks of that dyadic relationship of mutual exchange and co-responsibility for leadership that should occur in a community of practice. It placards the kind of leadership that rural charges need. Moving on then through the service, we next meet the deacon standing at the altar, standing to one side, while the priest centrally presides at the Eucharist. Standing to one side, having prepared the table for the meal by setting out linen and in, uh, elements in their various vessels so that others may draw near to eat and drink. Standing to one side in such a way that a page can be turned for the priest whose hands are otherwise occupied, or in some countries to swat flies on the wine. Standing to one side, ready to invite all to say the Lord's Prayer, ready to raise and assist in the administration of the chalice at communion. Standing to one side, poised and ready, complimentary, utterly necessary, but not centre stage. 
Richard Fabian, one time rector of St. Gregory's of NASA in San Francisco, uh, which is uh, on the screen now, describes the deacon's role as follows. The deacon marshals the lay people's liturgical ministry, announcing each liturgical event and where music will be found so that newcomers can take part as easily as all the rest. As a mark of authority, the deacon uses a strip of brightly coloured cloth, originally carried in one hand and later extended to hang over the shoulder, leaving the deacon's hands free for beckoning, prompting, carrying and shoving. As the service at St. Gregory's proceeds, we see the deacon doing just that, beckoning, prompting, carrying, maybe not shoving. If you go to St. Gregory's or you watch the online video of their worship dancing with God, you'll notice that the deacons do not do everything in place of others. Rather, every task they do, the setting up of books, recruiting of readers, rehearsing of sung responses, announcing of texts, every task is geared towards enabling the liturgical ministry of the laity. The deacon's role is clearly one of guidance and enabling. At the readings, for instance, the deacon goes into the congregation, invites lay volunteers out, leads them to the lectern, and then stands by them as they read the message. This stance then says something fundamental about leadership too, that it is about enabling others to affect their tasks, carry out their proper roles. All leadership should be diaconal in the way that the Swedish Lutheran Church defines that, to act as facilitators, to discover and mobilize the latent resources that exist in the parish. Similarly, John Willits, a deacon in the American Episcopal Church, writes, <coughs> Originally, I thought I was responsible for being deacon and doing diaconal ministry and that others were off the hook. <coughs> a change in perspective happened when I was reading the ordinal many months after ordination and thinking about my promises, especially number six. Show Christ's people that in serving the helpless, they are serving Christ himself. It dawned upon me that the use of the third person plural pronoun, they, meant that all of us have the responsibility of diaconia. Ordained deacons and priests are animators of the ministries of the whole people of God. And he sums up his identity in these words. I need to be a learner and a teacher. I need to be a servant and an equipper. And I need to clearly model servant ministry to God's people so that they can recognize and assume their diaconal role in the world. All leadership is about enabling others to do their very best and achieve their fullest potential. It's about being teachers and trainers so that others may be similarly well equipped. Ian Williams, in an article published in Rural Theology some years ago, reported on field research which sought to elicit which practices best encourage collaborative ministerial relations in the Anglican Church in rural England. The most strongly attested feature was supporting the personal development of others. He writes, clergy who write in this way teach, share and encourage people in their daily lives. They show interest and appreciation, they encourage and affirm people, and they appreciate the efforts they make. They don't throw you in at the deep end, but suggest ways of dealing with things and offering training and resources. They're helpful in explaining ministry and are aware of people's feelings, strengths and weaknesses, and they can see the potential in people. They enable others to see possibilities, gently stretching them to their full potential, ready to pick up the pieces if things go wrong. They wish to transform themselves and others seeing learning as a lifelong endeavour, valuable for themselves and others. There is just so much good practice alluded to in that short paragraph, tools and techniques with which those of you who have done the Germinate course will be very familiar. There is, in a nutshell, the Life Shapes Quadrant, which Joe Hopkinson writes about in Resourcing Rural Ministry those stages of development observed in Jesus' mentoring of his disciples. 
the directive leadership of I do, you watch, come and follow me. The coaching style of I do, you help, involvement of the disciples in his healing ministry with varying degrees of success. The consensus approach of you do, I help, sending the 12 out with a blessing, and the empowering stage of you do, I watch, of the Great Commission. There too is Gillian Stamp's wonderful tripod of work, tasking, providing clarity about expectations and providing a safe framework, trusting people to use their judgment in taking forward the work for which they are accountable, making sure that no one is underwhelmed or overwhelmed by the work, and tending, checking that the information and the training necessary to support the task is provided. As Emil writes in Setting the Church of England Free, when someone is given a leadership responsibility, it's vital to clarify the task that needs to be done and show why and how it is to be done. If that doesn't happen, then a mismatch of expectation is likely to cause frustration or hurt. If the leadership is to be creative and fruitful, the leader must be trusted with responsibility and encouraged to exercise initiative, not just be given a list of set tasks. If the local leader is to be enabled to grow into maturity with the necessary attributes and qualities of character, then it's vital that the person supervising value them for themselves, keep regular contact, thank them frequently, support them and build up their confidence. Accept and use failure, helping them to see every failure as a learning opportunity. If this good practice is adopted, then disciples grow into leaders and leadership gets distributed more evenly throughout a congregation. But as with our first stance, this second stance of standing to one side takes a particular kind of inner character, a particular kind of spirituality on the part of the enabling leader, and also on the part of the one who, by discovering a new gift, a new competency, steps into their own leadership role. It takes, I think, an inner ease with being a responsible behind the scenes person, able to be hidden, to get on with things out of the limelight. I call this a John the Baptist type spirituality, one that is at ease with decreasing as others increase, that does oneself out of a job. The type of spirituality that rejoices when others discover a capacity in themselves that outshines, eclipses your own, when they reach heights that you've never achieved yourself and are never likely to. The transformative power of such agency is well described in John 2, the first of Jesus' sign in that gospel. Many of you will know this delightful book, The Gospel in Art, by the peasants of Solentinami a book of illustrations of gospel passages by Nicaraguan campesinos. The illustration of this particular sign, sorry, it's a bit dark, it shows bride and groom on the left of the picture, along with the steward and wedding guests, all brightly arrayed, sitting outside in the sunshine, enjoying the marriage festivities. But across to the right of the picture stands Christ beside the water jars, and watching him are the servants and the children, absorbed, transfixed, attentive, but definitely not part of the main scene, marginal to the party, and yet participants in the real action. For as you well know, the servants are the enablers of transformation. The servants who had drawn the water knew, John 2, 9, they knew where the water had come from because they had been facilitators of the miracle by drawing the water and taking the jars to the stewards. They had witnessed the wonderful exchange for themselves. They had beheld the glory with their own eyes. And that is reward enough. Diaconal leadership asks of us that we be content to give power away, to be teachers in order that the church might be a community of learning, just as Jesus washed his disciples' feet in order that they might learn to be servants to each other. Not to do the ministry oneself or to be seen to do it, but to be eccentric to the action, to release the gifts in others through support, encouragement, equipping and inspiration. 
and then to get off the stage and step into the wings and watch, watch with glee. As Jerry noted in his recent article in Country Way, Julia Middleton, the founder of the Common Purpose Development Programs, urges leaders in secular contexts not to be in it for yourself. Enjoy the achievements of others. So it is with the church. Diaconal leadership, standing to one side of the table, reminds the church Sunday by Sunday of that attitude of heart, the crucial attitude of heart for all leaders. <clears throat> and finally, we meet the deacon standing at the door, or at least bidding the people to turn towards the door as she declares in a ringing voice, well, what we say, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. I'm not sure what the equivalent is down here. So, lovely, good. Bidding the assembly to embark on the liturgy after the liturgy, their daily lives of diaconia in the world, encouraging them to look outwards to make connections. And this third stance likewise says something fundamental about leadership, that it is world facing. All too often, the ministry of lay people is seen as being purely ecclesiastical. Thus, research undertaken for the Released for Mission report, the Archbishop's Council recent document about multi-church rural ministry in the 21st century, notes that the ministry of lay people was essential to the functioning of rural parishes. Lay people were deeply involved in all aspects of church life. So far, so good. But what does it mean by such functioning? The missional life of the parishes? The daily ministries of the lay people? It would appear not. By far the greatest percentage of that functioning relates to worship leading. Regular Sunday worship in many multi-church groups was sustained, the report says, by the ministry of lay people. Lay people were involved in all aspects of leading worship, in almost all the groups of churches studied, there had been an increase in the numbers of services led by lay people over the past 10 years. The report goes on to note the existence of formal ministry teams in several of the contexts studied, responsible for pastoral care and or the provision of worship. But again, though some teams also took responsibility for mission and outreach, these were few in number, as the focus for most was retaining regular Sunday worship and associated pastoral care. Only in the last line of that section of the report entitled The Ministry of Lay People does this rather forlorn sentence appear. It was acknowledged by some clergy that a balance needed to be struck between maintaining worship and other activities through the active participation and leadership of lay people and in allowing these lay people, time to develop their own discipleship and explore their own vocation further, particularly in relation to their involvement in wider community life. Bob Jackson's well-known quip that postmoderns treat churches like helicopters, they keep their distance for fear of getting sucked in by the rotors, <laughs> is very sadly close to the truth. It's all too easy to get so consumed and spent by the life of the gathered ecclesia that there is no time, energy or inclination to be the church out there in the world. Anne Richards, also in that recent edition of Country Way, what a good journal it is, speaks of lay people being underestimated, underused and ignored. She writes, I've been talking recently about a young Christian who has become a mentor to co-workers struggling with high rents, financial worries, job stress, relational problems and so on. Well paid but broke and with chaotic lifestyles, they turn to him to find out how his faith helps him cope. He is a frontline evangelist, but with no support from his local church, who just want to know when he is next going to turn up and when he's going to bring in new people. And probably, though she doesn't say it, something about money in there. He is a leader and a sower, but working in a field where his local church really doesn't understand. People abandon church going, she posits, when their work situations and their gifts for ministry in the world are dismissed as irrelevant. 
In his classic study of the theology of the laity, Yves Congar declared that the development of a theology of the laity would involve no mere adjustment of inherited ecclesiological views, but rather a reorientation of the whole ecclesiological vision. And that is what deacons do Sunday by Sunday. They reorient the congregation to cease gazing upon the altar and turn them around to face instead the altar of the world. As one form of service ends, so does another begin. The liturgy after the liturgy, the people's daily work. Deacons call us to the world. They boot people out of the door. That's maybe where the shoving comes in. In their list of discernment assessment criteria, Paul Avis and Stephen Ferns suggest that deacons need to be people who are comfortable with occupying space on the boundaries, a liminal person who is at ease alongside people on the edges of the church, people with an outgoing, risk-taking, world-oriented perspective. And that goes for all of us as leaders. We all need to be missional leaders, finding out what God is doing and joining in. We need to be multilingual interpreters, listening to God speaking in the Wittenberg marketplaces of today and using that same dramatic to speak of our faith boldly. We need to bring those insights back into our congregations and interpret what we've heard wisely and prophetically among the worshipping community. And we need to be leaders who are at ease with divesting ourselves of our church garb, beautiful though it may be, tying instead a towel around ourselves and attending to the needs of those around us. And those needs are many. A recently published report on poverty in rural areas of Scotland draws attention to the particular nature of social exclusion in that context. I don't need to tell you about it. The things are probably identical. Greater problems with access to many general services, and in particular to services for older people, higher levels of part-time working, lower levels of qualification, higher travel costs associated with employment, a lack of suitable public transport, lower levels of social support, higher maintenance costs relating to rural housing, and so on. Deacons stand at the door Sunday by Sunday and urge people to pay attention to those contexts, urge us to engage in an incarnational spirituality that knows that matter matters, as the great George MacLeod, founder of the Iona community, put it, that God is in all things and is to be found at all times and in all places. Three stances then, descriptive of healthy models of leadership, but our experience in the Scottish Episcopal Church, and maybe yours too, was that when attempts were made to distribute leadership more equally throughout congregations, building capacity amongst the laity, making the context leaderful, people all too often reverted to the type, or rather to the forms of leadership that they had experienced up till then. Leadership which privileged heroic, visible, centre stage, and ecclesiastical manifestations of the role. But as Martin Percy writes in his most recent book, this is not a helpful way to lead. It robs the collective of participation in comprehending the nature of their issues and challenges. Heroic leadership can quickly lead to demoralisation, mistrust, sullen consent, and the rapid unravelling of the organisation or institution. Since the publication of the Hind Report, leadership has become one of the key formational categories in any training programme for readers and clergy in my denomination. And for us in the Scottish Episcopal Institute, leadership in rural multi-church ministry is a particular concern. Much attention is being paid to ways in which active discipleship can be encouraged in such contexts. And as you well know, this requires a complete shift in outlook and approach from what has worked previously. Such a shift is being made by other organisations as they too try to find sustainable ways in and for a changing world. A recent joint paper from the King's Fund and the Centre for Creative Leadership wrote of the NHS in this way. The strategies and tactics that worked in the past are not sufficient to enable to address the challenges and opportunities of the future. <coughs> the leadership that has worked in the past 
is ill-suited to overcome the demands resulting from a changing demography and increasing complexity of healthcare delivery. <clears throat> and we've seen that this week. The paper urges a shift to a new collective leadership culture, but this, it maintains, requires new mindsets, not just new skills, new mindsets, new heart sets. In order to initiate such culture change, hidden assumptions must be unearthed, because unexamined beliefs control an organisation and prevent any meaningful change. Years of valuing hierarchy, status, authority and control can lead to assumptions and behaviours that undermine collective leadership and are unnecessary, unhelpful and at odds with the strategic direction of the organisation. The good news is, to close, new habits and skills can be learned, for they are in essence, as David Gortner reminds us, perceptual choices and modes of interaction rooted in practiced cognitive patterns. What we see enacted in front of our eyes subliminally influences how we behave. It builds habits of the heart. The stance of deacons in the Eucharist reminds us visibly, viscerally, that leadership is a collective resource, that it is enabling of others, and that it is world-facing. Or couched in another way, that it is relational, collaborative, and missional. So let us then walk the talk, putting our feet daily where deacons place them Sunday by Sunday. Thank you.